Welcome to the Citizens Report for the 8th of April 2020. I'm Elisa Barwick. Joining me today is Citizens Party Research Director Robert Barwick. Welcome to the show. Thanks, Elisa. And on today's show, the economic rethink that can avert an Australian catastrophe and China is not the problem. So, firstly today, the economic rethink that can avert an Australian catastrophe. Now, we are certainly in trying times and it's not just because of the pandemic that is sweeping the globe, but it's also because of the stress that our economy is being put under, which it cannot handle. Yeah. However, it should have been able to handle it, but there are good signs as we'll go through today that there is a complete rethink going on uh, to suggest that the current economic model which has led us to this disastrous situation cannot be kept. It must be thrown overboard. But it must be emphasised, Elisa, that we are heading, the way things are right now, we're heading for a catastrophe because we're, we're following this silly six-month suspended animation plus model, which is nuts. And it's be, you know this is a government that didn't want to acknowledge the crisis in the first place because you know, stopping tourists coming in from China will hurt our tourism, etc. So that, that was that was their economic thinking then that exposed us more to this. Now they've adopted some adopted some kind of a model where yes, they're taking the the, the health threat th seriously, but um, uh, they've they've couched in this terms of well, we're going to have to go through this for six months or until there's a vaccine. And even what we're saying, where we are seeing good signs, the problem is. We're not seeing the matching signs of a really intense mobilisation to gear up the public screening and public testing that can allow actually people to emerge from a short period of, of, of hibernation mm. into a more normal economy while we make these, long, these more important shifts in the long term, right? And, and it's because I think the government just doesn't know how to make the decision in this area. Despite We're going to go through some good stuff, but that's a real problem right now. Mm. And we need to change that and change that fast. So we'll be vocal on this, but we will talk about the positive stuff in the meantime. Yeah, and I think we are very clearly in just such a period of unknown territory that, as you're saying, they really have no idea what to do. And that's where we need to give direction. Our supporters all over the country can provide that crucial direction. Um, but some of the signs that there are at least um, people considering that shifts do need to be made and that we can't just return to business as usual as it was prior to this crisis, um, they're coming thick and fast. On the not-so-good side, you had Henry Kissinger, who's uh, been one of the leading figures, spokespeople for the Anglo-American establishment for many years. He's now 96, I believe. And he had a op-ed in the uh, Wall Street Journal on the 4th of April saying the, the headline was the coronavirus pandemic will forever alter the world order. And so that's a recognition of that is that's a he's recognition recognizing what's going on but it's what he says next Yeah because he basically said look um, with all these changes it is going to be necessary to quote safeguard the principles of the liberal world order. So when he's saying that Elisa Henry Kissinger speaks for the people to whom for 50 years or more foreign policy um, was actually pursuing the interests, the, the financial interests of the City of London and Wall Street. That's what this liberal world order is. Right? Which is what created the problem. Yeah, and they've, over, they've overthrown governments in the name of that liberal mm. world order. And that is, you know, he, so people, people like him are still going to try and protect it. But for other people, they're recognising that this has led us to the catastrophe we're in right now. Yeah, and there's a number of Australian comment commentators reflecting that. Um, probably the most interesting was Karen Middleton in the Saturday paper on the 4th of April with the headline, Officials inside Treasury are drafting plans for an entirely new economy. Uh, and she stated at the outset that traditional ideological positions are being jettisoned without a backward glance. And there is a growing view that the economy as we know it now may never be the same. Now, she, she was a bit thin on the ground in terms of details of what this meant with the, the, the Treasury looking for a new economy. Mm. And, and an element of when they talk about this at the moment is they're saying, oh, we're going back to Keynesianism, right? Well, that's just, you know, let, let's just flood the system with money, everything will be right. That's a problem. But other people are starting to think more specifically about the, the issues. Uh, you had the University of Queensland economist John Quiggan speaking in the conversation on the 2nd of April who said Australia's post-war recovery program provides clues as to how to get out of this, which is useful and we've talked about that ourselves. 
Uh, and he, he stressed that when we do get through this crisis, we should resist any attempt to return to the market liberal economy of the past few decades. And then Alan Jing, Jingle, Gingel. Gingel in the Australian Financial Review, and he was an advisor to Keating and head of the Office of National Assessments at one time, uh, he said the world we knew before the coronavirus will not return. And even Greg Sheridan, a neoconservative journalist, wrote a piece for the 18th March Australian headlined, Why This COVID-19 Pandemic Will Kill Globalisation. And a final interesting thing I want to note is that um, the New Daily cited Milton Friedman, who's one of the founders of this entire neoliberal system. But he was right on one thing when he said that only a crisis, actual or perceived, produces real change. When that crisis occurs, the actions that are taken depend on the ideas that are lying around. No, that's, that's true. And of course, the system that we developed was born out of all these different crises and they were seized upon to, oh, we've got to have this measure, we've got to have this measure. Well, and, and it led us to this point, right? And most of these, most of these measures that, that they implemented were scams of one form or another. Um, we now, this is, a, this is a crisis, it's time to, to turn the tables on these guys and actually make sure we use it to get people to think about how an economy should work properly. And in terms of the ideas that are left lying around, I mean, the way we've always thought the Citizens Party about politics is that you put ideas, good ideas out there that in a time of crisis are adopted because they're the only thing available yeah. that you know will work. Because we've, we've done, we've, over the years, we've left a lot of good ideas lying around. We have. Yeah. And now, hopefully, some of them will be picked up and we'll speak details about that very shortly. But firstly, I wanted to talk a bit about um, the kind of changes that we're all living through at the moment from the standpoint of the precedent of World War II. And I want to play a clip from John Curtin in 1942 when he addressed the nation and talked about how you know, people had to make sacrifices and everything had to change temporarily um, for the duration of that war mobilisation. And it just situates... Um, you know, what is going to be expected of people for some time. But as you emphasised also before, we have to make sure it's a very determinate and short-term well, frame. You, you make sure the threat is real and you tailor what you do to that threat. You don't just say, you know, like Curtin's going to talk about the war reality. Well, you know, there were wars fought in the past where, which were basically long, elongated business wars, right? We should, like, we wouldn't want to have made these sacrifices Curtin's calling on for the bloody Afghanistan war. Which we shouldn't even be in, right? Seventeen, twenty-year war. Curtin, you know, we we faced a real threat in Australia. There's the threat. Here's what we're going to do. He said to the Australian people, "Step up," and they stepped up. And it's actually quite inspiring. And they could, they'll do it again if the government shows the right leadership. The full cabinet today directed the war cabinet to gazette the necessary regulations for the complete mobilisation and the complete ordering of all the resources, human and material, in this Commonwealth for the defence of this Commonwealth. <laughs> that means clearly and specifically that every human being in this country is now, whether he or she likes it, at the service of the government to work in the defence of Australia. And the crucial thing is that what went hand in hand with that war effort was a complete transformation of the real economy. And one of the things that Curtin stressed in a subsequent speech was he said there will be a place for every citizen in the country. And yeah. even John Quiggan stressed that in his piece where he said the success of the World War II economy and mobilising all available resources, including workers who had long been unemployed and apparently unemployable, right? So you transform the economy to put everyone to work uh, against the emergency. So that's crucial. And we're going to come back right after this quick break to discuss some of those prospects right here, right now. <laughs> Welcome back to the Citizens Report, where we're discussing the economic rethink to avert catastrophe. Now, Nev Power, who's formerly from Fortescue Mining Group, 
Uh, he has been appointed by the government to head up the COVID-19 cooperation or coordination, I should say, commission. And he's discussed uh, and spoken about the enormous opportunity to reboot manufacturing due to this crisis, which needs to be done. Now, the commission itself, Elisa, is a mixed bag, I must say. There's people on there that I'm thinking, what the hell are you doing there? However, one very positive thing, in my view, is that um, subordinate to this commission is a national manufacturing task force, and the government has appointed Andrew Liveris to that. Now, Andrew Liveris is the Australian who's the former head of Dow Chemical, one of the biggest companies in the world, but he's not a finance guy. He's actually an industrial chemist or something like that who made it to the top of the company. Um, and when he was the head of this American company, he used to come back to Australia and say, why aren't we manufacturing more in Australia? Now, we've got all the... We're, we're, we're drowning in gas. We could have the cheapest energy in the world and have a real competitive edge. And, of course, it was always ignored. So that's why he's always thought. Now he's in a position where he can influence that mm. and we've, we've got some ideas on how to make that work. Now, I want to just run through a few instances of you know, the types of mobilisation that is going on, but I will say, and you can read more about it in this week's Australian Alert Service, that it needs to become far less piecemeal and hopefully yeah. Power and Liveris and these people can make that happen and begin to coordinate a real national effort because once we start to take care of ourselves in terms of the supplies that we need in Australia to deal with the coronavirus, we should be helping other countries. Absolutely. We should be flooding the world because we have an immense manufacturing capacity and also in food production and so forth, forth with countries that might be affected and not able to keep up supply and production. Um, but a few excellent examples have come to light. You have um, a company in Echuca which produces um, machinery for production lines, Food Mac, and they've been asked to create three new machines for the company up in Shepparton that one of our supporters, Joe Carmody, who we did a tribute, tribute to on the show a few weeks back, um, designed and built to produce face masks and other personal protective equipment. Um, so they're doubling capacity there. So they're reverse engineering some of these machines to create more. You have Detmold, a packaging company in South Australia that's producing surgical and respirator masks. You have Ancel expanding their production of gloves. You have companies um, even in fashion like Q and RM Williams that are producing scrubs, surgical gowns and masks. Orthotic, orthotics makers and 3D printers are producing eye shields and face shields. Distilleries, brewers and even juice makers are making hand sanitizer. Yes. Well, you might not agree. They're turning a lot of excess kegs of beer into sanitizer, literally. So oh, are they? A, it's a crying well, that, shame. That's a bit unfortunate. Anyway, um, <laughs> all for a good cause. Gecko Systems in Ballarat have produced a Mark III prototype ventilator, which is based on a UK design. It's very simple, portable, uses low oxygen. Cablex, which is a Melbourne defence company, is, which makes electrical systems for helicopters normally, is going to produce ventilators. And 888 Racing, it's a V8 supercar team based in Brisbane, has produced a model of a ventilator in just 10 days. I'll roll a clip. Uh, Roland had the idea to, to repurpose our uh, resources in, in design and manufacture. So uh, straight away he, he wanted us to start looking into ventilators. The world is uh, screaming out for them. Uh, so we started just doing uh, some initial research uh, the week after the Grand Prix and then uh, started design work on Friday the 20th. What this is, it's basically taking a BVM bag, which is a standard bag that you have in ambulances to um, help people, assist people breathing. Um, so using that off-the-shelf stuff, we've manufactured a uh, drive mechanism to drive the, the bag. Um, you can adjust things like the tidal volume, so that's the volume which goes into the lungs, uh, the ratio of intake to um, exhaust, in engine speak, uh, inspiration versus expiration, um, how fast you breathe in versus you breathe out, that's, that's critical, uh, and also of course the breaths per minute. So yeah, so triple eight strengths is that we can solve problems quickly we can analyze the issue, we can uh, design it, manufacture it, test it, and get it back out into uh, where it's needed. So just with the, the small team which can do everything, we can turn around a problem into a solution within, as I said, 10 days. One week we're at the, at the racetrack trying to, trying to go fast, and the next thing, uh, the whole world is, is screaming out for ventilators. So, you know, stopping your tracks, full 180, and do something completely different. Uh, the biggest challenge uh, is just getting it ready quick enough with uh, what we had available. So 
Uh, Friday uh, we started the design, by Monday we had a, a working uh, prototype. Uh, the, the electronics was, was the most difficult part because what we wanted wasn't available, uh, so, so Pete had to take what was available just to get the proof of concept working, uh, but to do it in such a quick turnaround time, we've tried to source everything from around Brisbane and the Gold Coast. If this needs to be used, it could be a bit of a dire situation where it's not in a hospital, it's outside somewhere or in a setup, um, sort of a small ICU unit, so power mightn't be consistent, so that means we need a bit of a, a UPS on board, so if um, power drops down, uh, it can last for at least two hours until we can get the power back up and running into the machine. We, we do want it to be open source, so we are going to put it out there. Any information people can, can help us to improve the product and, and if we can get other people around the world further ahead with their own designs or if they can just take this and, and actually use it, then uh, yeah, it's, it's out there for everyone. And there's also a lot of work going on the medical side of things in terms of research, tests and treatments. But there's one thing we can do immediately to get this into high gear, and that's using the Clean Energy Finance Corporation, which we've discussed in a press release today. Yeah. Well, so in a situation like this, you need to have money, right? And you can either take the, the path of borrowing money and just spending it and then paying it back, or the, the beauty of having a bank, a government bank, a public bank that can lend the money out into these things that are going to themselves make money, Right? That's, that, that goes without saying there's a boom in these areas, is that you can use the power of credit to be able to achieve what you want. Right? And um, you know, we've always advocated a national bank, and you, but we're in a position where Parliament's not even city. You won't be able to legislate for a national bank, but we're really showing up how we're lacking in one. Well, we have an existing institution, which we mentioned last week, the Clean Energy Finance Corporation. So we looked at what would, what would need to be done to its legislation to, to amend it, to make it adapt it so it can just go beyond renewable loans for renewable energy and actually t play the role of a major lender in a situation like this. And the precedent, as we said last week, was what Franklin Roosevelt did when he came to power. He, wanted, he had a whole big program. How do you fund it? Well, the Congress wasn't actually going to give him a lot of money. There was this bank there, this Reconstruction Finance Corporation, said we're going to use that, right? And they used it brilliantly. This is the same thing. Well, it turns out from the legal expert that and, and myself that were looking at this, very little actually has to be done to the CEFC to adapt it and to repurpose it and recapitalise it, as we suggest. Um, so we've put up forward a proposal and just go through the details. We've got $130 billion. As, today's Wednesday. We, we're shooting this early because of Easter. Um, $130 billion being approved in Parliament today to support idle workers who are in non-essential industries, right? We're saying we should be getting those people into things that need to be done now, and that's, the, that's why you would do this sort of thing. Um, by the way, Elisa, if we spent more of that money in the kind of gearing up of screening and testing that we advocate, right, South Korea style, we, would, we wouldn't have, a lot of those even non-essential workers could still be working. We wouldn't need that $130 billion, mm. right? But... but um, so given that we've got this Dow Chemicals guy, Andrew Liveris, with a certain manufacturing acumen, good. He can be the sort of person to take a coordinating role here like Essington Lewis did in, in, in World War II. We've got the CEFC, use it. Um, it has a ministerial regulation that gives it a lot of direction that doesn't require parliamentary approval to change. Right? So you could say, you could, you could insert that ministerial regulation, okay, its scope is much bigger, put it to use. And, and, it, and in a sense, the sky will be the limit in terms of pump out the loans. It can, have, it can operate through subsidiaries. It could be putting out loans to agriculture to make sure food security is, is um, expanded at a time like this. Manufacturing, infrastructure projects. It could have public infrastructure projects. State and local governments could come and borrow from this thing for the things that they need to do, right? We need to have some big projects going at the moment, frankly, right, in parts of Australia because that sort of infrastructure is sorely lacking. So this, act, this institution could do it. We've put forward that proposal. I've had a lot of high-level discussions in the last few days about this. And I know it's being listened to. The question is, um, you know, can we make it happen? And that's what we'll be pushing for. So read our press release on our website and contact your MP to advocate for this. Now we'll be right back after this break.
Welcome back to the Citizens Report. We're now discussing China is not the problem. Elisa, before you begin, this is going to be controversial and that's just life, but we're going to say it. I just want people to understand one thing. They're being told by certain forces to hate one particular country and fear it. We're saying to them, there's no reason to hate or fear anybody, mm -hmm. right? And um, the, the first one I would argue people can capitalise on and take advantage of. And we're trying to say the world doesn't have to work this way. And if you, if you take the blinkers off and look at, th look at for actual evidence, um, you have to change your view of it. Mm. Now, one of the big scandals, of course, was that China had mobilised various companies to come to Australia mm. and buy up all this personal protective equipment and so forth back in January when they were in the middle of the crisis and in we were very weren't. severe crisis. Um, now, Andrew Forrest of Fortescue Mining Group was one of the people who mobilised his charity arm, uh, Mindaroo, to buy a lot of that equipment. Now, in the last couple of weeks, however, he has gone to China and he has delivered back to Australia a million N95 respirator masks, 400,000 surgical masks, 2.3 million medical grade gloves, 100,000 nasal swabs, 200,000 medical coveralls, 10,000 medical goggles, 5,000 touchless thermometers and more than 30 ICU grade ventilators. And a partridge in a pear tree. <laughs> and I'll also add that you have the United States at the moment interdicting and commandeering supplies, even going to planes on the tarmac and diverting yeah. a plane that was taking medical supplies to France, diverting it to the United States and other countries as well. And yet there's nothing said about that. Yeah. So, Elisa, one of the things that's come up about this is everyone wants to blame China for the virus. Now, I spoke to a very hot, one of the highest levels experts in Australia on pandemics, and she said... Pandemics are nobody's fault, right? The thing is, did China make mistakes at the beginning? Of course, they're trying to figure out what they're dealing with. They had, they had some early stumbles. But on the 3rd of January, Chinese authorities spoke to, spoke to the US Centers for Disease Control and tell them what they knew. 3rd of January, the problems in the United States, the problems we've had, you cannot blame on China, right? Whatever their early mistakes might have been, the problems in the United States are entirely their own. And you know this because everyone hates Trump so much. A lot of information comes out with the two sides warring over this, mm. right? They can't hold a straight line. And the both sides are, in the United States are guilty of this. But, in a, but the question has become, we need reparations. China must pay. And, a, and, a, and an evil organisation in, in the, the United Kingdom, the Henry Jackson Society, responsible for most, the, cheering on most of the wars the last 20 years, right? has called for China to pay, pay $6 trillion in reparations. And in Australia, that comes down to we need we should take off ch away China's foreign investment here and, and make them pay. And I've had to point out, because a lot of people assume China owns Australia. Mm. So we wrote an article in last week's e issue of our alert service. We'll put these on the screen. Even if we took away China's investments, it only touches the sides because they're actually not a very big investor at all. The United States is far and away the biggest, over $900 billion. China has $63 billion and that's down from $85 billion a couple of years ago, right? Their investment's falling. You see on the pie chart there what a tiny sliver they are compared... I mean, Belgium is a much bigger foreign investor in Australia, for crying out loud. Um, and... We have this chart that shows Australia currently has more investment in China than China has in us. Hong Kong doesn't count because Hong Kong is a special administrative region and, and, the, and the investment comes from Hong Kong is sometimes by Hong Kong Chinese people, sometimes by British people, mm. right? So um, it's overblown. It's not the issue. We need to, in a time of crisis like this, look at what's working, what's not. China's done a lot of things. So once it got its act to get a lot of things right, we should be co cooperating with everybody. And let's show the world how to gear up their economy, which is what we must do now. So thanks for tuning in. Join us again next week.